Thank you so much, Joe, for the invitation. It's a real uh, honor to speak to the Lily Fellows. And it's humbling, too. Uh, it's such a wonderful gathering of people who are both committed and engaged. So I uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I was thinking it was hard to follow Gretchen and Gerardo and then the oratorio thing. <laughs> 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 Just so astounding to see such a broadly cooperative work uh, in, in the humanities. We, at least I tend to work in my, by myself, but our work is collaborative as well. So I'm speaking to questions that I've formed over the years uh, with colleagues, friends, some of you, uh, drawing from the work of others. And I hope that in some way it's useful to the questions you face in your uh, work and location. The conference theme is face to face in time and place. And I'd like to devote my reflections to the broader construction of space within which contemporary higher education is located. One of the most, uh, I will consider the nature of social space uh, within which we attempt to be face to face and within which our particular places are constructed. One of the most profound transformations affecting our places today is globalization. Globalization is not, however, simply a new and larger place. It fundamentally changes the nature of social space in a way that affects all of our places. These changes in the nature of space constitute some of the assumptions implicit, um, challenge some of the assumptions implicit in our understanding and practice of higher education. Much of what I will say might sound pessimistic, so I should give you a little prelude about the nature of, of, of my theological practice. Uh, I aim to not theologize too soon to uh, label cultural contents, uh, to focus on ideologies and contrast them with Christian doctrines uh, and ideals, but to try to understand how the dynamisms are working in culture, and then think about how we could engage them, uh, to use them for ends that we desire, uh, or perhaps work against them tactically when necessary. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is mostly trying to get at an understanding of how global space works. Uh, much of that might sound pessimistic, but the goal is always practical, to, to know and own where we are and face the challenges and potentials of that moment. So let me open with some of the positive potentials. Um, I should establish my, my, my credit a bit. I have an undergraduate minor in uh, computer science, uh, and I, was, <laughs> I, wanted to, I did an independent, uh, independently designed major, which the uh, provost, uh, who was also the head of the computer science department, uh, and it's actually now a Byzantine archbishop. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of religious higher education. Uh, he, I wanted out of the assembly language course, because I said I'm only getting the computer science minor to perhaps feed a family while uh, my, uh, my degree in social justice, if that should not pan out. Um, <laughs> he said, no, you need to take assembly language. Because there you get an understanding of how the machine of a computer works. And once you understand that, you understand what they do. And without that, you'll never have a critical understanding of what software and computers do. I, I fought him tooth and nail, but he was both the head of the computer science department and the registrar, so I took the course. Um, <laughs> and he was absolutely right. That was one of the best courses in something like critical theory of technology I've ever had, because I knew that there were registers down there pushing and popping things, uh, and I know that that's at the bottom of all of these simulations and all the mediations we do. Uh, so knowing how things work is really quite important. Uh, and my goal today is perhaps to try to think about how global space works. Uh, transportation and communication technologies provide unprecedented possibilities for communication, coordination, and cooperation, both within and across groups, up close and over great distances. Uh, Pope John Paul II, I think, was really able to offer rather profound insight to see beyond the neoliberalism which dominated discussions of globalization in the 1980s and offer a potential positive vision for what globalization could be. He famously spoke of the possibility of the globalization of solidarity. Christianity is a missionizing religion and has its own deep dogmatic reasons for imagining the ultimate communion of all creation and for discerning the particular, imagining the particular character of that communion. The globalization we speak of today must be evaluated in that light. And a big part of that evaluation is the fate of particular communities and their places um, in that evaluation. 
This theological insight into space and salvation resonates with an argument Edward Soja advances in postmodern geographies. That modernity and modern critical thought are marked by a hegemonic historicism of theoretical consciousness, which so preferences the historical and the temporal over the spatial that it's blinded to the undeniable, undeniably spatial aspects of human sociality and solidarity, and to our dependence and impact upon our environment. Much the same can be said about Christianity. The modern understanding of the Paschal Mystery and discipleship of God's work in the world and our grace response to it has been overwhelmingly conceived in terms of time and history. This has perhaps its most compact expression in the term the signs of the times used by Vatican II in the Constitution, Gaudium et Spes. There is much that's good in this, and as Gaudium et Spes clearly shows, spatial concerns are not necessarily obscure. Nonetheless, there is something in this temporal focus that inclines to a deficient form of cosmopolitanism that focuses on the big issues being debated in metropoles and capitals elsewhere. Thus, the message is often conveyed that smaller locales are backwaters. History is taking place elsewhere. This was precisely the experience I had growing up in the rapidly rusting city of Pittsburgh in the late 1970s. The tide of history had once been there and had gone elsewhere. This seems to me to run afoul of the Catholicity of the Church, which requires us to attend to the fullness of salvation in all places. Soja quotes John Berger, the quote's often attributed to Soja, prophecy now involves a geographical rather than historical projection. It is space, not time, that hides consequences from us. Christianity envisions salvation embracing all persons, creatures, and places, even the backwaters of history. It is for this reason that I'm interested in how the changing nature of space is changing places and our relationship to them. In my own work, I try to understand the implications this has for religious community and moral responsibility. To offer but one example, to point back to the opening quote, what would it actually take to put the ideal of the globalization of solidarity into practice? So to turn to the question of higher education in global space, the liberal arts have always had an implicit or explicit relationship to particular spaces. For example, the Greek polis, various ancient imperial bureaucracies, the Latinate cosmopolitanism of medieval Christendom, Renaissance city-states, modern European state bureaucracies, uh, the modern nation-state and its imperial variants, and most recently what Ira Ong describes as neoliberal citizenship in the current global context. The university and its predecessors have had complex relationships with these contexts. More of, uh, often, scholars and schools rel relied upon them for their existence, providing education for citizens and functionaries and emperors, even as they harbor transformative and even subversive aspirations. Tender radicals are nothing new. All observes that American higher education has long addressed students as both citizens and as rationally calculative professionals, citizens and professionals. These two dimensions of the student were held together both by personal character and by the broader context of national space. Here, individual careers and professional actions were balanced by the accountability of citizenship. The local nature of economic production and consumption reinforced this balance. The circle was closed. The so-called poorest economy of the 20th century continued this coherence. The intensification of industrial capitalism required a concord between state, labor, and capital that kept stakeholders in close proximity to one another. Both Henry Ford's notorious experiment with the social department that monitored the home life of employees and what Saskia Assassin has termed the Fordist family wage made the point that factory owners were dependent on the social stability of labor for successful production. This was evident as well in the broader way of investments and support for local education and civic life that industrialists contributed to the towns and urban places of the 20th century. In this economy, the market overlapped with the scale of government. As a result, negative market externalities, pollution, dangerous working conditions, etc., were susceptible to political correction, not perfectly, but the scales coincided. 
In this era, the political world of the citizen overlapped with the economic life of the worker, the professional, and the factory owner. This was also an era in which our assumptions about culture were formed. Benedict Anderson has shown the important role that print capitalism played in the emergence of nationalism. The printing press precipitated the emergence of print vernaculars that forged diverse spoken vernacular languages into national scale linguistic zones. The technological developments of the Fortis era gave rise to 20th century mass media, and they reinforced this effect by creating national scale entertainment in public spheres. Both culture and what we might call the public epistemology of the news mapped to national space. Here we can return to the historical focus of modern Christianity. While this often referred to universal salvation history, the history was often imagined and experienced in the national spatial scale. The notion of the signs of the time spoke profoundly to generations involved in national independence movements, the struggle for gender equality, the civil rights movement, all of which, despite their cultural dimensions, were still deployed to transform and appeal to national legal regimes. The national space, spatial context provided the unity presumed as well by the deepening specialization in the universities over the last half century. Man, I'll just compress greatly here. Universities could produce and train students in advanced knowledges in the humanities, social sciences, and technology without an overarching intellectual synthesis. Advanced research and training in potentially revolutionary fields such as psychopharmacology, embryonic biology, and intelligent weapons systems could be undertaken without requiring similarly advanced training in ethics for those same students. Because presumably, moral evaluation would take place in the national civil society and politics where such as experts in both ethics and technology could contribute their complementary expertise. The economic and political changes of the past 40 years, brought about by the multiple dynamisms of globalization, have fundamentally changed the spatial context within which we work, rendering these assumptions in the way we conduct education problematic. Again, this would be a very simplistic account of the change. Um, the Fortis economic equilibrium underwent sustained crisis in the 1970s as national markets for durable goods began to reach saturation and thus weren't able to continue to fuel the rapid growth necessary to sustain large-scale, vertically integrated firms and the expectation of labor for an ever-rising standard of living. In response, business sought flexibility in sourcing, production, and labor relations. At the same time, advances in information technology and transportation and an ideological political support for free trade enabled an explosive growth in outsourcing that gave rise to the global commodity change that characterize almost all industrial production today. These bring about what Thomas Prinson has termed the distancing of production from consumption. This systematically deprives consumers and producers of feedback concerning the full costs and conditions of production of the goods they consume. Our goods seem to arrive from an infinite frontier, a place where resources are infinite, Waste can be disposed of without consequence, and labor costs can be infinitely reduced. To give you one example, when I get up in the morning and have orange juice, the can in the freezer says this can contains concentrate from the United States, Mexico, Brazil, or China. I've done something on three or four continents there, and I have no idea what. It cost me a dollar nineteen. Is that a fair price? I have no idea. While any form of commodity exchange is susceptible to negative externalities, in a global context, these externalities take place beyond the boundaries of the national political community. The impoverished children of underpaid workers, victims of industrial pollution, the despoiled landscapes that are part of the story of our standard of living, are so scattered and distant that they are never brought into what remains of our civil and political discourse. <coughs> 